and I'll hand it over to you. Well, thanks very much, Christine, for that introduction, and thanks to you and the other organizers of NavHub for the invita invitation to um, present. I, I, I want to first commend NavHub on the series of presentations that you've been able to put together, and I hope that what I present today will will build on that. Um, I'm fortunate to have been able to work for the last couple of decades, actually, um, with some really interesting interdisciplinary teams doing transdisciplinary work on a variety of issues related to full spectrum sustainability. And I'll talk about that in the talk and how that relates to the challenges of improving governance um, going forward. This includes my home institution of, of DFO and, and, and UNB that I've been affiliated with for, for some time the Canadian Fisheries Research Network that you mentioned, but also a couple of modules of the Ocean Frontier Institute um, projects, Module I, which dealt with governance um, and uh, future oceans and coastal infrastructures project that's ongoing. And also with Australian organizations, including the CSIRO and the Center for Marine Socioecology uh, in Hobart. So the big challenge that NavHub is dealing with um, and that forms the context for this talk today is that of changing systems, changing social ecological systems, social ecological systems facing change. We know that we are to face big change as indicated by the one of the, you know, any of the IPCC um, figures, including the one on the right. We don't know the precise change, but we know that that there will be major change and that this will have major disruptions ecologically and as a result um, in terms of social and, and, and um, economic consequences. Um, <clears throat> a recent, uh, the recent Gulf of Maine symposium two years ago looked at the changing Gulf of Maine and started a conversation among diverse groups in terms of resilience and sustainability. And from that, that uh, uh, symposium, there were uh, several papers produced and they're in a, a volume of the journal Elementa, a dedicated volume of the journal Elementa. There are four synthesis papers. Um, on physical conditions, on air temperature and sea level rise in storms, on climate impacts, and on ocean acidification. These indicate that we are actually quite well able to, um, to predict some of what's going to happen. We don't know precisely what's going to happen, but we know there will be big changes in, in these areas. Uh, big system change with some uncertainty. But that's not the case. We, we're not as well able to predict how to manage in light of that change. So the, what I'd like to address in this talk today is management change for climate change. And in the, in the, to d address the issue explicitly that, 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 that NavHub asked of me, what about vulnerabilities? How do we deal with vulnerability and, and risk? So I would ask then, what are the vulnerabilities of the social ecological system? Social ecological systems require consideration of ecological aspects, economic aspects, social and cultural aspects, and institutional or governance aspects. This is indicated in many ways, including by the Sustainable Development Goals in the 2030 Agenda. This list of Sustainable Development Goals is very broad. Right? It, it's, it's enormous, it's huge. It deals with all aspects of a social ecological system. And we're not used to dealing with such a diverse set of considerations. Um, certainly not at once. We're dealing with them in individually, and these are all strategic issues. These are all issues that require a lot of further work. In the Canadian Fisheries Research Network, which ran from 2010 for about a, a decade, we tried to look at what are the spectrum of objectives 
related explicitly to fisheries um, in terms of full spectrum or four pillar um, uh, sustainability. And these are the ecological ob objectives that we are all familiar with, productivity and trophic structure, biodiversity, habitat and ecosystem integrity. Economic objectives, including viability and prosperity and livelihoods, but also very importantly, the distribution of access and the distribution of benefits arising from fisheries and regional economic benefits to community. Social and cultural objectives of health and well-being, sustainable communities, indigenous and other cultures and ethical activities. And also the institutional objectives or governance objectives, legal obligations, including those to indigenous peoples, good governance structure and effective decision making processes. So this we suggested in several papers uh, was the is the is the spectrum of considerations. And I suggest these are the this is the spectrum of vulnerabilities that, that we need to consider when considering ecosystem change. I'm pleased that this spectrum has been picked up and is, is being advanced in, in several areas, including in, in our region, uh, in Maritimes region, by an initiative, an EBM initiative, ecosystem-based management initiative led by Alida Bundy and Max Westhead. We've gone on, I've worked with, with a group internationally to look at that full spectrum, that list of full spectrum sustainability and how it relates to some of the uh, concepts, sustainability related concepts, including ecosystem approach, integrated management, marine spatial planning, uh, and so on. And our group concluded that all of those sustainability related concepts are evolving to consider this broader range four pillar set of considerations but especially at the moment they emphasize different aspects of, of it and as a result we should be using these concepts um, com in a complementary way uh, borrowing from the various concepts to have a quilt if you like of sustainable ocean governance but the point here is that that the concepts are evolving to include that list or some variation of that list of considerations that I mentioned. In the same way, we see convergence in Canadian legislation towards full spectrum sustainability. The revisions to the Fisheries Act and the Environmental Assessment Act put it put them more make them more holistic and more in line with the with the visions of the Oceans Act and the Sustainable Development Act. So we're seeing evidence in many ways of the movement towards this broader spectrum of considerations. So with that in mind, how does management have to change? In this very old paper, paper uh, I just I shocked myself to realize it was 25 years ago that we we worked on this. Dan Lane and I looked at the current decision making um, uh, in in fisheries. This was oh, sorry, and we concluded that it, it was it's linear that we tend to create stock assessment information, fishery science information in a peer reviewed process, and that becomes public biological advice that goes to decision makers who then are considering other considerations, economic and social aspects. They're also considering um, interest groups and, and, and um, the, the input from advisory committees and lobbying and so on. And that results in decisions regarding harvest limits that, that are then implemented. It's a linear um, process. And we proposed at the time that, that it should be a more circular process in which the biological, social, economic, operational, and, and, and other aspects of the fishery system are put together in management scenarios, advice alternatives, and that there's a risk assessment um, included with that, and the decision makers work in a risk management um, way 
to to action uh, decisions for management and and that there's feedback and monitoring of this so and this borrows from the principles of management science that dan lane was was well rooted in and and that i've become um more enlightened to since and it's um and it's it, it still holds true today i think that we should be working on on alternatives advice alternatives that have risk assessment built into them and, and span the spectrum of choices that we might take. Going on to look at shortcomings of management that persist to today. And if you think of management as the series of, of activities, each with management plans under them, so fisheries management plans for various species in various areas, aquaculture management, transportation management, and 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 so on. I think it's fair to say that there are a few um, problems with management today. First of all, different authorities are managing different activities in different ways. Secondly, they are using a different and incomplete set of objectives, values, and perspectives. So there's no evaluation of trade-offs or of risk and there's no evaluation of cumulative effects. That's the cumulative effects of our management, I mean, against some of these objectives. And as a result of this, there's no ability really to deal with climate change or social and economic change. We are managing in a sector-based way. Each activity is managed separately. And as a result, we there are several things these five things missing. How could we improve that? Well, working with a group in, in Australia on integrated management, we proposed that the a logical approach would be to build on the current management we have rather than chuck it out and start afresh, but modify that management in some integrated management initiative that applies some common ecological, economic, social, cultural, and governance objectives to various sector-based plans, common objectives. Not all objectives would need to be common, but there would be some key common objectives that would allow consideration of trade-offs and would allow performance against cumulative effects and would give a system level perspective to what is currently a collection of sector-based plans. Let's move on now to talk about uncertainty and, and, and risk and vulnerability. We, we have quite a few methods, and some of these have been dealt with already in, in talks in NavHub, in NavHub um, that deal with uncertainty and 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 risk and 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 trade-offs. Things like multi-criteria decision making, um, risk and vulnerability assessments, um, the uh, management strategy evaluation, and so on. There's there's a long list. And in a group of the Atlantic Ocean Research Alliance, in in a meeting that took place in in 2020, I think um, we we looked at at how to strategically treat trade-offs, but the same could be said of, of risk and, and vulnerability. And we suggested that they, they require articulation of, of the values that need to be achieved. So some version of that list that I presented earlier in the talk. Once you've done that, it's possible to identify the trade-off or risk, then to evaluate it, then to present it, then to inform decisions, and then hopefully to validate it. But it requires that the objectives be articulated um, first. And if you think then about adding to that how we might deal with scenarios against this broad suite of objectives, I think this cartoon is, is useful in which there would be management options, management scenarios, ABC in this case, evaluated against 
ecological, economic, social, cultural, and institutional objectives. So think of this in terms of, of various TAC options for a particular fishery or more holistically in terms of the status quo, scenario A, versus a scenario in which you add something like an in-stream tidal power project or a wind array or something. This could be a small uh, array and this could be a larger array, let's say. And you'd look then at to what degree do these three scenarios meet the objectives ecologically of productivity, biodiversity, habitat, of economic objectives, including those to individual participants as well to communities, social cultural aspects, and governance aspects. This, I suggest, is the is or some version of this is where we have to go with both our advice to support decision making and with the uh, function of managing um, uh, with re in respect to to diverse scenarios that have risk and vulnerability inherent in them and i think that this is along the lines of what jake rice was mentioning of multi-dimensional outcome space uh, in in his talk so that's a quick shot at current issues of management and full spectrum sustainability. I'd like to spend the rest of the, the talk on, on how we could be more strategic in, in implementing some of these. And I want to first mention the Australian uh, Climate Change Adaptation Handbook written for fisheries adaptation and perhaps a good resource for, for the, the people in, in NAVHUB, um, in which they're looking at in a stepwise progression of looking at, at climate change, species ecosystem change, then of changes in the fishery, and then of changes in management. This is fairly straightforward stuff, although it's done very well in, in Australia in this initiative um, uh, led by uh, Beth Fulton. And I was pleased to have been able to be part of this by chairing um, a really interesting workshop in which the Australia Fisheries Management Authority dared to ask the question, are we able to facilitate adaptation or are we an impediment to adaptation? I thought this was really forward thinking by the Fisheries Management Authority to ask, are we an impediment or are we able to facilitate adaptation? And in that workshop, we, we worked with, with members of, of industry and, and government and, and, and researchers on identifying for, for several case study fisheries, the physical drivers, the ecological responses that we're already seeing in, in Australia, even more so than, than, than here in North America, the effects, fishery effects and responses, the market responses, the management issues, and then knock-on effects. So we went through this, this, this lineage this pathway of impact to develop scenarios for various fisheries. So on the left, you see for the Southeast trawl fishery, the flathead fishery, for example, right? What, what are the, the drivers and responses that we're already seeing, distribution, changes in distribution? What does that mean in terms of, of, of how the fishery is acting? It's having to move, it's having to change its gear, et cetera, et cetera. The market response, and the management issues. What are the management issues? To what degree is management facilitating adaptation or being an impediment? A, a very interesting um, and valuable approach to this. And the Australian um, CSIRO developed the, 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 the handbook or the adaptation handbook in which they, they talk about ecological risk and, and, and scoring that with fishery, it risks and the ability of the fishery to adapt, and then management risks and the ability of management to adapt. So a very structured approach to, to, to looking at, at, at risk. But that same group has gone on to think about, about, about that process, which is, which is a reactive process, right? What are, what are we seeing and how are we going to react? 
and and they've started to think about can we be proactive and there's a, a, a group that was formed by um, CSIRO to, to, to look at futures, to look at, at, at future thinking. And, and, and it's, it's been a very interesting group to be part of. And in the first paper that came out of that group, uh, led, led by Carly McDonald, came out in 2019, we looked at the fact that most of our science is reactive, <clears throat> right? We're asked a question, we, we, we answer it. We do a study and we answer it. In relation to climate change, because of, of, of pressures, political pressures and other pressures, some science is becoming marginalized or in fact inactive, increasingly un unwilling or unable to engage, which, which is a shame and that's another story. But the point of this paper was that, can we be more proactive? We're not used to being proactive as scientists, where we're actively involved in developing strategies before impacts and where we're actually affecting change. And this gets into a whole lot of issues about of, of science advocacy and, and, and that kind of thing. But, but the point here is, I think in relation to climate change, we need to think about whether the science we're doing is simply reactive and whether that's sufficient, whether we're being marginalized and inactive, or whether we can in fact be proactive or how we can be proactive to affect positive change. And several groups um, have been looking at the future and ways of imagining the future. One initiative that I, that I would point to is one ar arising from the Center for Marine Social Ecology in, in Hobart, in which called Future Seas, in which they've looked at what can be done, what might be done during the time frame of the ocean decade, 2020 to 2030, in terms of, of proactive change in, in science and in an issue of um, reviews in fish biology and fisheries that just came out a month or so ago, there are the results of a series of, I think, 10 or a dozen um, uh, key issues in, in, um, in futures thinking that, that the group has, has looked at in terms of what happens if we take a business as usual approach to 2030 versus what might happen if we took a more sustainable um, strategic approach and changed the things that we can change towards 2030, e you know, even in a decade. And they looked at the issues of, of indigenous and traditional people's perspectives, uh, food for all, um, various aspects of uh, pollution in the ocean and some of the key uh, issues. But the point here is that they formed expert groups and worked over some time to identify scenarios. Business as usual scenario, what would happen if we carried on as we are versus something more sustainable. And I refer you to that volume um, came out in, in March, I think, of, 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 of this year. That leads to the issue and the technique of foresighting and planning for better outcomes. Foresighting is a structured process for exploring alternative future states. And I like it because the, the literature, the limited amount of literature around foresighting to date recognizes that we might be able to take actions now to put us in a better place in the future. And in a paper that was um, led by uh, Rachel Kelly, just came out in, in in marine policy. We looked at the technique of foresighting and this figure is, is from that paper. So in that foresighting, you look at the, the future in terms of what is possible, the, the, the outer circle here, what is plausible, and then within that, what is probable, so that's like the status quo, versus what might be preferable and what actions might have to be taken to achieve something that is preferable. Two other figures from this paper on the, the right, 
the, the space of complexity and uncertainty and, and how prediction, projection, exploration and speculation uh, sit on, on that spectrum of, of, of uncertainty and complexity. And also the fact that as we go forward in time, especially in an issue related to climate change and have declining system state, we actually narrow the scope of, of opportunity to achieve future sustainable outcomes. But at some point then, we can start acting to increase the funnel and have regenerative possibilities if we look forward to um, preferred outcomes. There's quite a bit more to say about that that I can't this morning, but but just to 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 put on the table this notion of foresighting um, as a technique that I think will be very useful in um, dealing with vulnerabilities and adaptation. And to say that the group has has gone on to study <clears throat> the techniques of quantitative foresighting, including uh, a paper that that Alistair Hobday led. Uh, came out in 2020 um, in, in which we do, did a set of experiments with our with our group to look at how um, the group as a group was able to get agreement on their notion of of when certain um, issues related to marine resource management and science for example would take place so we canvassed ourselves experimented ourselves to say what would be the indicators that something was going to take place, a scenario was going to take place, and when, in what year, would we think that might take place? Is it something that's going to happen quickly or something that's going to take longer? How would we know when it was happening? And what was the agreement among a group of 20 or so um, experts right? and, and, and on the timing of this? And this sort of idea of how well we're able to predict, how how tightly are is it, can we get agreement from expert groups, or you could think about as even canvassing the general public, and then um, what would you do about that in terms of of, of foresighting and using it as the basis for decision making? So that work is in its early stages, and it and it continues, but just to put point out that people are working on this sort of thing, which I think is 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 fascinating and really useful. So then the final things that I want to say in in this presentation is that it relates to vulnerability risk assessment in uh, in social ecological systems and the fact that it's an interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary um, issue that I love this cartoon that, that, that is the result of a, a cartoonist sitting in at a, at a scientific conference and saying that you're, you're talking about the, the interdisciplinarity and the, the need for it. The, the new expert will, will, will have diverse disciplines, but of course we don't create individuals with this diverse set of expertise. Rather, we need teams. We need to put together experts into teams because we have the silos of our organizations and backgrounds and, and, and disciplines. And therefore, we need to learn to work in interdisciplinary teams. And there's quite a, an increasing literature on, on that, on working in interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary teams. And again, a paper that Rachel Kelly uh, led uh, canvassed people who had worked in interdisciplinary teams in terms of, of what are the key um, lessons for young researchers and for organizations that are trying to encourage this and came up with, with, with the list. Um, so management change for climate change. I think five items that I'd, I'd like us take away, I'd like to think as take away from this talk first manage as a social ecological system in which we consider ecological, economic, social, cultural, and governance vulnerabilities and risks. Manage using risk-based approaches that 
explicitly weigh the pros and cons of comprehensive scenarios. Consider foresighting in order to be more strategic about achieving preferred outcomes and that this will require interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary teams. And with that, I'll finish by acknowledging and thanking many colleagues who have contributed to the, the thoughts that I've contained in this presentation and who are listed on the various publications. I, I hope this has been of use and I look forward to discussing it with you. Thank you.